Good evening. My name is Rose Jansen, for those of you who are here tonight, and I am with the Academy of Science St. Louis. Uh, we partner with the St. Louis Zoo on this particular series, Conservation Conversations. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are a local nonprofit. We've been around for 150 years. We're an independent science organization, and we are devoted to the public understanding of science and inspiring the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we do that through a number of outreach programs and initiatives and public science seminars and talks like this one here tonight. Um, if uh, you are a student and you are here this evening and you need to verify your attendance, you can come see me after the talk. Uh, we have a number of public science seminars and events that are up and coming. Some are here at the zoo as part of our science seminar series, and some are up and coming conservation conversations. And you can find more information on both of those outside at the visitor's desk before you leave this evening. The brochures probably weren't out there when you ar arrived tonight, but they are out there now, so feel free to pick some of those up as you leave. Um, what else did I want to let you know? Um, another event that you might have an interest in attending next Thursday, we do a series in partnership with the Kirkwood School District. It is free and open to the public. And we have a woman from the University of Missouri St. Louis who will be talking on comets and their contribution uh, to life here on Earth. And then uh, the, we, the other series that we do here with the St. Louis Zoo, the Science Seminar Series, begins on October the 5th. Um, we have Wendy Applequist, who is with the Missouri Botanical Garden, and she will be talking about plants as medicines. And then the next in our conservation conversation series after tonight's talk on the Grevy Zebra uh, is Money, Myths, and Man Eaters. We have Amy Dickman, and she will be talking about researching carnivore ecology and conflict in Tanzania's, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Raha Ruaha Landscape. So with that said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Eric Miller with the St. Louis Zoo, and he's going to introduce tonight's speaker. Well, good evening, and thank you for coming. I'm uh, Eric Miller. I'm the uh, senior vice president, but for tonight's purposes, and frankly, the favorite part of my job is being the director of the Wild Care Institute, which is the umbrella for our conservation activities. You're going to hear tonight about Grevy Zebras and the Horn of Africa Center, which is one of our major initiatives in conservation for species that are related to the zoo and are critically endangered in the wild. Tonight's speaker is from the Grevy Zebra Trust and is a major collaborative partner of the Wild Care Institute Center for Conservation in the Horn of Africa. It's our pleasure today to welcome two members of that team, Belinda Lowe and Peter Lalampa. Peter, why don't you stand up since you won't be speaking so people can see you, to share with us information about the programs and the projects of the trust. The Grevy Zebra Trust is the only conservation organization in the world which devotes all of its time to conserving the endangered Grevy Zebra. Belinda co-founded the trust in 2007 with colleagues Martha Fisher and the late James Manugi. I'd like to ask Martha to stand up because um, she's been one of the most active uh, partners in this program, not only nationally in the United States, but internationally in pulling other partners in to assist with this effort. Belinda currently serves as executive director of the trust. In addition, she is a certified educator in holistic management and trains communities and methods for addressing and, and trying to alleviate habitat loss. Peter has been working with the Grevy Zebra Trust as a regional coordinator since November 2007. Coming from the Samburu area, which you'll hear more about tonight, Peter has a special affinity for the region and a desire to give back to his community. He is dedicated to his cause as he recognizes the future of wildlife and conservation and pastoral livelihoods all depend on the same resources. So thank you again for coming tonight. We're proud to have this program in uh, conjunction with the Academy of Science. And please help us welcome Belinda Lowe. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see you. Can everyone hear me OK? I'm just I'm wearing one of these uh, mics that's not 
That's what, yeah. Anyway, it's hands-free or whatever you call it. Um, so I just wanted to check. Um, well, thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction, and also to the Academy of Science um, for partnering with the zoo to host tonight's talk. I'm just going to also introduce a little bit more about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Kenya, so I was really privileged to grow up uh, with the wildlife of Kenya and meeting the people of Kenya and interacting with them throughout my life. And so that has basically um, kind of inspired my love of wildlife and is why I'm doing the things I am doing today. Um, how many people here have seen a grevy zebra in the wild? So a handful of people, excellent. Um, well, you'll know that they're extremely uh, different to the more common plain zebra. So there we have the plain zebra, and next to them, the two grevies here. Um, so they're much bigger, they're kind of like the Clydesdales of the zebra world. Um, and they have these beautiful fine stripes, huge ears, uh, these lovely white bellies here. And the Samburu, in Samburu it's called, called uh, Loibur Kurum, which means white rumped animal. And if you look up here, uh, they have this white patch, um, and it gleams in the sunlight. So when you see them in the distance, you can really see that white patch gleaming. And I have to draw attention to the ears, because really they are the most fantastic aspect of a grevy zebra. And I'm always uh, arguing with wild dog people, you know, who has the best ears, and I think we win hands down. So. And you can see a foal grows into its ears. It's all legs and ears at the beginning. Um, so the range of the Grevy zebra um, is in the Horn of Africa. Here we've got Ethiopia um, and Kenya. And if we zoom in a little bit to that area, uh, the lighter green is the historical range of the Grevies. So you can see that it was once in Somalia, Djibouti, and Eritrea as well and over much larger parts of Ethiopia and Kenya. Um, it's now confined to this area here. And in fact, this is quite an old map, so we are hoping to refine this map next year in a workshop. Um, and unfortunately, the range has shrunk even more. So, Grevy zebra, um, there used to be uh, 15,000 in the early 1980s. Um, we're now down to 2,500. Um, they are listed as endangered on IUCN's red list, um, and they are also on Appendix 1 of CITES. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about their social system um, so that you can understand how, the threats affect, how threats affect them. So this is a territorial male. Grevy zebra uh, breeding males, adult breeding males, um, they defend a territory with the resources that, they, that females need inside that territory, so grazing and water. Um, and you can see here, this guy is on a mission. These, <laughs> these ones are looking on, wondering what's going to happen next. Because there's always quite a lot of action around the territorial males. You never know what's going to happen next. They basically are defending their territory against other males. Um, and particularly if there are oestrous females within the territory, then they won't tolerate any other males. And you will often get uh, scenes like this, where they look like they're about to fall over. Because oh, sorry they're like chasing each other. So that's going to result in a huge fight at some point. Um, the females um, with their foals tend to associate socially because they have the same resource needs. Um, so typically a grevy zebra can go up to five days without water. Um, but when they're lactating, they need to drink at least every other day in order to produce the milk uh, for their foals. And so what ha happens is that they will end up um, associating in, in the same kind of group. So females with foals will be in one group because they need to be closer to water. Females that don't have foals will be further away because they can afford to go and find grazing elsewhere. So I'm going to talk about the threats now. Um, and I've put, first of all, habitat loss as the major threat. Um, and that's at the top of my list because um, basically it's the most widespread threat and it's also one of the most difficult threats to address in a short period of time. The next threat is limited water. So in terms of availability and access to water, um, Grevy zebra are facing increasing problems. Um, this riverbed that uh, you can see here used to be a perennial river. Um, and then 
pretty much since, well, over the last decade, it's been drying up every single year, and that's because of over-extraction in the highlands. Um, and it's not just the animals that depend on this, it's um, all the pastoralists that share the range with the grubby zebra as well. So it's one of the major issues that we face in this region. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, and also, what happens uh, during dry periods is uh, if it's a bad drought, then the water table will actually drop. Uh, to a level that the grevy zebra can't actually uh, reach that water. And so that can also be an issue. Um, and so we're working on that with, with pastoralist communities to try and alleviate that pressure. Uh, illegal killing is also a threat, but it's, not, it, it's, it's confined to areas where the ethnic groups um, utilize wildlife as food. Um, and within Samburu, which is the main region where the grevy zebra are and uh, where the biggest numbers are left, uh, poaching is not a, a problem there because uh, the people don't actually eat their meat. Um, but poaching has been exacerbated by the uh, widespread availability of firearms, um, which you know, is something that is kind of beyond our control, but it's also very easy to counter because you can put into place security uh, using the communities uh, within those areas um, and therefore have a team of people protecting the zebras. And finally, one of the emerging threats is disease. So there's obviously a very close interaction between uh, wildlife, and um, wildlife and livestock. And so the disease transmission um, risk is much higher um, in this kind of landscape. <coughs> so the Grevy Zebra Trust um, was founded in 2007. And we have um, five pillars within our organization. Our organization revolves around and the first of these is community. And in that respect, we recognize that communities, pastoral communities, which share the land with the Grevy Zebra, are the primary stakeholder. And therefore, we engage them in everything that we do. Um, these are some of the uh, amazing men and women that work on the team. 90% uh, of our staff is, is employed from those communities that we work with. And just a little. Uh, glimpse of field life, so we're very mobile. We always have a, a camp which we move around, you know, packs up into our car, um, and we move around so that we are always like engaging with the communities rather than, you know, driving back to a sort of hotel every night or something. We're actually there, we sit around the fire, that's when some of the best decisions get made about conservation action is around the campfire. We're always making tea because it's necessary up there, um, so we always have kit available. And yeah, in the evenings, uh, we get creative with our torches and <laughs> anyway, it's just silly. Um, the second pillar is conservation. And when I talk about conservation, I mean conservation action. So real um, action that's going to make a difference to the future of the species. This is one of our Grevy Zebra Scouts. We have a, a long-standing scout program, which is kind of our flagship program. And it, it employs women and men uh, to collect data on Grevy zebra and to also to raise awareness on the species. I talked about uh, illegal killing. This is one of the um, ambassadors. So we have ambassadors in areas where poaching is a threat. Um, and these, these uh, men are employed from different ethnic groups. So these ethnic groups actually historically um, have been in conflict. So a lot of their job is actually to promote peace, um, because without peace we can't really have stability and cons for conservation. Um, so they're both providing security to the zebras and also providing peace and raising awareness about biodiversity generally. One of our new programs that's coming up, which we're really excited about and which um, has been funded by the St. Louis Sioux Field Conservation Program, um, is Grevy Zebra Warriors. So this is a group that we haven't really directly engaged in conservation yet and that really we need to um, because they are the next generation of leaders. Um, and they also have a huge influence um, on their peers. So by engaging them, we're hoping that we can use them as messengers to the rest of the community um, to be able to change behavior and attitudes. 
Um, this is one of our scouts here. He's actually, so I was talking about water being an issue. In the dry season, what we do is we monitor the water that's being utilized um, by the grevies, the most important points. And then we make sure that that water remains accessible throughout the dry season. So um, in a sort of normal dry season, it will just mean like digging out this water so that it, it has a nice kind of shallow entrance coming in, so they just walk in. And grevy zebra can actually dig for water themselves. Apart from elephants, they're the only other species that digs for water. Um, so you know, they can get by, but if the water table starts to drop, then it can become an issue. If it gets really dry, then we will actually fill uh, troughs for them and leave them uh, full of water. Um, we've been able to also build dedicated grevy zebra troughs, um, which are also available for other wildlife. So that means basically um, using existing boreholes um, within the landscape, which are being used by livestock and people. And then what we do is extend um, a pipe out quite far so that the um, trough is away from people and livestock and all the action, because that puts uh, wildlife off coming to water. Um, and then the community will fill it. And we just have this as a dry season measure. Um, and that really helps to alleviate the pressure. Uh, this year, we've actually been feeding hay to the Grevy zebra. Um, it's been, we identified it as a drought year in January, and we had a huge number of births occurring. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we actually were able to uh, maintain the condition of the females, because um, we knew that they were going to have to you know, travel quite far to water every day. Um, and so we specifically targeted females and their foals. Um, and it's been really successful, this uh, initiative. Uh, you can see here, this is the hay on the ground here. It's a bit difficult to tell with the colors, but, and then there's a whole load of foals in the background. So um, if you look at, oh, sorry. Anyway, I'll come, on to the, I'll come on to the results of the hay program in a minute. I thought that. Um, one of the other um, issues that we have is there's uh, one particular um, stretch of river, dry season river, which when we get uh, rain upstream, water will come down and then it very quickly dries out. And this uh, mud here actually looks like it's dry. Um, so animals will cross it, but then they get bogged down like this zebra here. So what we've done to try and alleviate this is we've employed volunteers um, to patrol this stretch during high risk times. Um, and they're equipped to be able to dig out these animals that get stuck. Um, but we have actually, she's just got out of there, so she's walking off. But we have actually lost um, quite a lot of zebras as a result of, of that mud. Um, and the volunteer system is now working quite well. So that, I think, will continue because we can't really see how to, to change it. It's such a, a huge area. Um, we don't know how to alleviate it. <coughs> Um, habitat restoration is one of our major focuses. Um, so obviously the hay feeding is a very short-term measure and you know, we don't want to have to be doing that all the time. So in the long term, we want to be able to in improve the resources that the grevy zebra depend on. And in our habitat restoration work, we're working with um, community conservancies um, in northern Kenya. So this is... Uh, uh, Stephen, he's the head of security for Westgate Community Conservancy, and this is his family. Um, and what we do with the communities is we, we look at um, how, how people want their lives to be in terms of their quality of life. So basically um, having a vision of, okay, how, does, how do we want the landscape to look to be able to support this quality of life? And often um, we look at the we we'll look at the past landscape and the present landscape to look at the changes and then to see, okay, where are we going to go from here? And these qualities will revolve around uh, generally livestock and then obviously the family um, and maintaining that traditional way of life that the Samburu have. Um, I should just mention that the Samburu way of life is changing because of um, things like uh, schools and clinics that have come in. So, you know, they've always been traditionally nomadic um, in nature and moving around. And so that's why um, they're able, the habitat is able to support them because they have actually been so mobile. So they have, there's a recovery period for the grass. 
Um, but now with uh, changing lifestyle, obviously they're going to have to adapt their management. Um, and so we have to work within that reality. So it's still trying to promote the culture, but at the same time um, planning the grazing to basically suit the, the context that's happening now, which is that people are not moving like they used to. So we use livestock as a tool in two ways. Um, and we're doing this um, for long-term change. The first tool is grazing, and the second tool is animal impact. So overgrazing um, results uh, um, from basically a plant being regrazed too soon before its root system has time to recover. So when a plant is grazed, the roots um, are pushing energy up into the um, top part to, be able to enable it to grow again. But if the, the um, animal comes back too quickly uh, to graze the leaves, then you end up uh, you know, having more and more energy pushed up by these roots, and eventually um, the root system dies and the whole plant will die. So we are working with communities to plan grazing and, and incorporate recovery time into that plan um, to ensure that a plant has time to fully uh, re recover and reseed before being grazed again. The second tool is animal impact. Um, so this is recognizing that um, in natural systems, so for example, this is the Maasai Mara here, you need a lot of animals to keep grasslands healthy. And it's the behavior of these animals um, that makes the difference. So these animals are moving in a bunched way. Um, and the way they move is their hooves are tilling the soil. They're incorporating litter into the soil. And they're dunging and urinating, um, so basically fertilizing the soil as well and aerating it. And that's what uh, keeps these incredible grasslands so healthy. And we can mimic um, nature, basically, using livestock, so bunching livestock. Um, and here, we've got them for, for areas where there's bare ground. We can actually corral them um, so that they're concentrated in, on bare ground. Um, and those corrals move every week, so up to seven days. So with the Westgate Community Conservancy that I was talking about, um, we decided to do a pilot project to test this in a, in a small area. Um, and this is the grazing committee here um, who, and the herders who are just looking at the grazing plan. Um, so what we do is we estimate forage availability. Um, and for this plan, we were, we were planning for four months of a uh, dry season. So we wanted to know, okay, we are going to be in here for four months. How long, how many animals can support, uh, can this land support for that amount of time? Um, sorry, I'll just explain a little bit more here. So what we do is we, we estimate the area. So we've actually got a square laid out here. We estimate the area um, that's needed to support one animal unit, so one cow, basically, for one day. And then from there, we can extrapolate uh, based on the size of the area and, and also the quality of the, of the habitat. So this is our grazing plan. It's always done uh, on a map. Um, so I won't explain it to you right now. But basically, uh, the communities that we work with, the majority of people are non-literate. So we have to do a visual plan that they have um, put together themselves. Um, and what we, what we do is we try to, in this particular plan, the water source is down here. This is the Waso River here. So um, we tried to, A, mix up the nutrition, nutritional quality of the, of the forage. So that means instead of like, typically going towards, you know, going to eat all the really good forage first, we actually mix it up so that throughout the dry season they have a mix of low and high quality forage. And that maintains a more average uh, condition for them throughout the dry season. And we also try to um, ensure that the livestock ends up closer to water at the end of the dry season, so it's not having to travel so far to go to water and therefore would, would lose condition. So this is just a little... Um, so, so we had 200 cattle in this pilot project, and they were all bunched together, so that we had four herders that made sure that they were moving as one unit and weren't scattered over the landscape. So that avoided them overgrazing, and it also ensured that they were um, using their hooves, you know, we were using their hooves as a tool to make sure that the soil was aerated. Um, we also had bomas uh, placed 
um, on bare areas to, to regenerate those areas. Um, and this is just the watering point where they went to um, every other day. And what was really fantastic about this project was that Grevy Zebra hadn't been in this area before. Um, and they are now there. And I, when I was there last time, there were six females there with foals. So for us, that's a fantastic result. This um, project uh, also made sure that we incorporated the, the whole community um, because we wanted to try to uh, encourage people to want to commit to this on a wider scale. Um, and so we had elders coming, we had women coming, and we had warriors coming um, to see what was happening and to also check on their livestock because they donated their cattle to the project. Um, we did monitoring, so we were monitoring the movements of the livestock uh, as well as uh, grass utilization. And we've done, um, we've done monitoring of where the bomas were. So now, once we've had uh, rainfall, we need to now um, monitor the, the response of those boma sites. When I say boma, I mean corral, where we had the cattle corralled. So we have, the, we have inside the corral and outside the corral um, to, to measure change. Uh, we also combine this with short-term tools. So we, um, there's, a, there's an, a species of tree called Acacia rufficiens, um, which is indigenous to northern Kenya, but it's uh, invasive in the, in the sense that um, as soon as you get uh, dry soil and bare soil, it will establish uh, very easily. And people don't utilize it, and nothing grows underneath it. So in order to make that uh, basically unproductive land productive, um, we, we had a clearing project where the community cut by hand, cut the acacia down, um, and then we reseeded with an indigenous perennial grass species. Um, we also filled up the gullies uh, with some of the um, branches of the acacia efficiency to try and slow the runoff of the rain. Um, and what we did then was, once it had rained, we were able to collect um, the grass seed. So now we have a little bank of grass seed um, stored at the Conservancy, which we're going to use um, actually this month um, for the next uh, clearing project. And I really like this quote from one of the elders. So he was saying, we shall never speak of drought or rainfall again because we can't control it, um, but we shall start planning for what we can control. And I think that's really important for people to know because it's so easy for us all to kind of blame climate change and you know, uh, say, well, it's out of our hands. Actually, we can do something about it. We just need to uh, use what's available to us, which in this context is livestock, and try and make the, do the best that we can with what we have. So the third pillar is um, education and awareness. Um, and our team is always um, going out and messaging conservation every day in what they do. Um, so what we try to do is emphasize the intrinsic value of Grevy Zebra, so not just focusing on the economic value and the benefits from that, but also just the role that Grevy Zebra plays within culture um, and tradition. Because, in fact, um, the pastoralists have coexisted with all this wildlife for many, many years, and, and the wildlife is embedded within their culture. And so it's just reviving that, that uh, link, that connection. The scouts also have uh, glove puppets. Um, so these are you know, handheld puppets, and they've, they've uh, made up shows to communicate the, the different themes uh, within Grevy Zebra Conservation and show like, you know, what, what the community would be able to do to help Grevy Zebra. And these are fantastic because uh, it engages people in a very different dimension, which they're not used to. We also offer scholarships um, for secondary school uh, education. A lot of the communities, um, they don't have enough resources to send their kids um, to school. So primary school is free, but secondary school isn't. Um, and so we provide the opportunity for promising uh, students from those communities to be able to go further um, and actually uh, get a job. Because primary school, you know, it, it allows you, it teaches you to read and write, but it doesn't get you a job. So being able to finish school is, is a huge benefit. 
Um, in order to assess all the conservation work that we're doing, um, we engage in collaborative research and monitoring projects. Um, so we have a collaring project, um, and these collars are GSM, uh, which is global, glo global, global. Uh, I can't, sorry, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's what's in your mobile phone. I'm sure someone here probably knows what it is. Um, so they use the mobile phone network in, in Kenya, Safaricom it's called, um, to transmit data to the internet. So they send the data by text message. Every hour, the caller takes a GPS point, and that GPS point then gets transmitted via text message um, to a server. And then we can just look up online and see where the zebras are. So we're able to use that data um, to look at fine-grained uh, responses of Grevy Zebra to the different management interventions that we're doing. Um, Grevy Zebra, their fingerprints are basically uh, uh, like, their, their fingerprints are their stripe patterns, so each stripe pattern is unique. Um, we have software that can identify each individual. Um, so we've got a photographic uh, project where we do surveys, take photographs, um, that we then enter those uh, photographs into the database, and the database will sort through all the individuals in there, and they will come up with a match. If we don't find a match, then we enter it as a new individual. And that's going to be really interesting. Over time, we'll be able to um, track, uh, we'll be able to track full survival. Um, and we've just started this project, so I'm hoping that in the next couple of years, we'll really be able to see you know, uh, what's happening with the populations that we are uh, trying to protect. Um, here we've got camera traps uh, set at water holes. So it's actually another way of capturing the, the stripe identification data. Um, and it also enables us to monitor the utilization of the hay um, that we've been putting out. And also, if we're modifying water in any way, we can see whether the grevy zebra are actually reacting to that water. So we're hoping to also put these camera traps at the troughs that we're building um, and, yeah, monitor. I said that disease is an emerging issue, um, and so we are looking into that in a uh, more in-depth way. At, at the moment, um, this is from a Babesia project. Babesia is a tick-borne disease um, which affects donkeys and apparently zebras. So we're just trying to understand more about the dynamics of the landscape. And um, it's, all, uh, it's all interconnected. We've been talking today to the, uh, one of the St. Louis Zoo veterinarians about this, this whole um, issue because it's quite complex. You know, you have, a, you have so much livestock, you have wildlife. And so it's, it's really important to understand, okay, what, you know, how, is, how, is the different, how are these different diseases being transmitted? And we're not just dealing with one disease, there's several that could be playing a role here. So we've been really fortunate um, to partner with the St. Louis Zoo. Um, many of you probably don't uh, know that the Wildcat Institute um, has been the foremost partner for Grevy Zebra Conservation in Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, and that has led to other partnerships as well. So it's been the backbone for the trust's um, kind of establishment. Uh, it's the foundation of, of the work that we do. Um, so for that, I would like to, to thank everybody from the zoo that's here tonight um, for that support. And also, you know, I'd like everyone to recognize the, the important role that the zoo plays in conservation in the wild. And I'm going to now invite Peter up here um, because I think it's uh, really important that people hear Peter's story. It's uh, very interesting and um, also I think shows the significance of the work of the trust. Um, so Peter, Karibu. I just have to take this thing off. Hold on a sec. Okay, so. So good evening, everybody. So as you've heard that um, uh, my name's I'm Peter, and uh, I work with Belinda, and we've worked uh, since 2003, uh, 2007, sorry. Uh, I've been working with the Grave Zebra Trust, and I'm one of the regional coordinators. Uh, but one interesting thing about uh, my coming, and uh, you know, why I want to give a short, brief story, 
uh, just to be a little bit brief, is because I come from the same land where we are trying to do the conservation of gravies. I come from the same communities and I've been born there. I, I went to school uh, late, actually after doing a lot of pastoral activities uh, within my community. And uh, one thing that strikes me, and that's why I do conservation today, is the fact that we have a lot of intrinsic values that we attach ourselves with the wildlife. It's not just the economic value. One very important aspect about our pastoral way of life is our wildlife and livestock are really interlinked. They really depend on one common resource, and that's our land, our pasture. They are very interlinked. And, uh, you know, when you miss livestock, in, uh, I mean, when you miss the uh, wildlife in your area, you start questioning, what's not happening? Uh, am I really able to sustain my life after some few centuries? You start questioning. Because, as a matter of fact, when I was young, I used to take my father's, uh, you know, cattle out to herd. And wildlife were part of me, you know. I could go herding, you see so many Jerenak, so many, you know, elephants, so many giraffes, and, you know, they became my companion, they became part of me. Uh, I could go herding, at the end of the day, you know, I come back, I'm sure I've brought all the livestock back because wildlife played a part. And the interesting part is your instincts in the bush are guided by, you know, the wildlife around you. When you miss the herbivores around your habitat, that's when you question and you start knowing, oh, surely there must be a predator around. So you become attentive on what you're doing. And when you see that you have the herbivores around, then fortunate enough, that's when you relax during your herding. So it, it also dictates our herding skills. Another value that I attach with the wildlife, and that's why I went ahead and said I needed them in my land, is the fact that, you know, water points are created by wildlife in some of our areas. Elephants really dug some of our water points that we depend on as pastoralists. Uh, the gravies plays a very important part, just to tell you a brief thing about them. For sure, some of the areas where we live, you can hardly get water. But the tracks of the gravies will lead you to where there is water. It's a very interesting thing. Because once you know the gravies are taking this route, you will know very well that they are ending to a water point somewhere. And because of that, I really think that this is an important resource that we have in our area, but we are losing it. And people will question, uh, are you losing the gravies because you're eating or what's happening? As a Samburu and from that community where I come from, it's a taboo to eat the gravy. We only eat animals that have divided wolves. We don't eat the gravies. So where are they going? That's a big question. I think the big issue about the gravies is the habitat. And it's affecting wildlife as well as us as pastoralists. We kind of losing now cattle and we are changing our way of life. We are having new species being introduced just because the landscape we depend on can no longer support the cattle, which was our love of our life. The cattle are part of us. We love our cattle, but the land can no longer support. The same applies to wildlife. So when Grave Zebra Trust goes ahead and does habitat restoration program, it touches the life of, the life of a pastoralist. It touches the life of a pastoralist. And I always feel like that's where we should start because it will touch the life of our pastoralists, it will touch the life of wildlife, and I believe that will create a balanced ecosystem for us, which is something that we are losing. Another interesting thing about uh, you know, the pastoralists and wildlife is that although we are not poachers uh, as Samburu, 
when you come back home, people will tell you, do you need food? Then somebody might say, oh yes, I'm hungry. Another one will say, oh no, I'm full. Then they will ask you, what did you eat? You were in the wild, you were in the bush. The interesting thing is, we are good in following the vultures. They are good guides. They tell us where the lion has had its prey, and so we eat the remains from what the lion has left behind. You come back full having had your bite from the bush. You have a barbecue. So it's, it's, I, I consider it as part of me, a part of my life, and I always tell people this story that, you know, wildlife is a very important component of pastoral life, but we are losing. We are losing if we don't have support. And I'm glad to stand, you know, before this podium and thank those people who are making us achieve that. Thank, you know, St. Louis Zoo for being the backbone to ensure that we are running those programs. Because I come from that land. And on behalf of the community, I think I'll have a better chance to say thank you for what you've done. And I'll bring their thanks. I'll come here and thank you on their behalf. So on a nutshell, I would like to say thank you for listening and thank you for coming to this talk this evening. Thank you. Maybe if anybody has some question, I will, I'm ready to invite, especially on our pastoral way of life and another question. Uh, actually, according to the stripe pattern, uh, the right side and the left hand side are totally different. So we always go for one side, either the right, for consistency, uh, because the stripe pattern of the left and the right are not the same. Maybe I could just invite Belinda if you, you have anything else to say. Thank you. Any questions for me? <laughs> yeah. Pro yeah, we estimate between 15 and 20, but probably more like 15. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, it's 1,200 hectares. Um, and we're just starting um, an area which is about, it's gonna be about uh, probably 6,000 hectares. So, which is, yeah, it's not, it's not all of it is clearing, it's just planning the grazing in that area, so. Yeah, no, it's um, it's in a community conservancy. So by that, um, it's a, yeah, I should I should have explained that. Um, it's basically communal land. So the pastoralists um, have group ranches. So there's certain families that are members of that group ranch and therefore have access. I mean, anyone can come in from outside and also use the same resources. But people who are resident there are members of the group ranch. And that particular pilot project that we did. Um, was a designated area that they decided to put aside just for this pilot project. Because um, it wouldn't have worked if we'd had lots of people coming in and out. <laughs> so. Yeah. Sorry, I can't, sorry, can't hear. Yeah, no, the other zebras do as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there legs, the legs that, I think, why do they get as tall as they show here? Their legs are so much taller than they are here. Yeah, they kind of grow into their legs. <laughs> so, they're, they're just all legs and ears when they're born. Yeah. 
about 450 kilos for a big male. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> How much? 900 pounds. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>